right, so I already introduced Susan. She's with the Parks Cultural Landscape Program. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. I apologize. Thank you. Um, once again, Barbara asked me to speak about climate change response and cultural resources in the National Park Service. I'd like to just touch upon this subject very quickly and then just move into a little segue back to cultural landscapes. So Barbara asked me to talk about a policy and guidance framework that the MPS is using to respond to climate change and to protect cultural resources and also the tools the MPS is using to identify impacts associated with climate change phenomena on cultural resources. The National Park Service established a climate change response program in 2007 and the person that really should be doing this presentation is Marcy Rockman. Marcy, Dr. Marcy Rockman is our cultural resources coordinator with the climate change response program. They have a website and you can reach out to Marcy, Marcy underscore Rockman at mps.gov with any questions or ask me. And the program created a, a service-wide climate change response strategy in 2010 and there are so four basic tenets of this strategy for the whole MPS and climate change, and that is science, adaptation, mitigation, and communication. With, um, first of all, we're conducting scientific research to support adaptation, mitigation, and communication. We're implementing mitigation by reducing our carbon footprint in the operations of the National Park Service, and we are developing the adaptive capacity to protect natural and cultural resources within a changing climate. And we are providing effective communication about climate change to our partners and to the public. And overall, we have uh, this four pillar climate change response strategy for all that we do in the National Park Service, including natural and cultural resources management. And we've done a lot of thought about how cultural resources management can fit with this four pillar strategy, science, mitigation, adaptation, communication. Science is where our section 110 inventory work really comes into play. Mitigation is where we implement rehabilitation treatments perhaps to conserve energy in our operation of historic properties. Adaptation, we might uh, implement more sustainable operations to increase the resilience of properties and uh, communication, of course, we have to have climate change literacy to be able to communicate effectively with the public and partners the kind of impacts that are occurring on cultural resources. We also have a brand new climate change and stewardship cultural resources policy in the National Park Service that the director signed in the last year. And it focuses our work on research and management practices and encourages us to have an approach that's flexible, that integrates the significance and the unique characteristics of the resources in our decision making. It integrates cultural and natural resources data from in research, planning, and stewardship. And also asks for managers to use discretion to be able to respond to emerging threats rapidly and to incorporate cultural resources into sustainable operations plans. It also encourages us to engage fully in cooperative conservation and civic engagement and also to refocus our inventory efforts on the lands that haven't been inventoried and the lands that are most vulnerable and to try and understand the fullest range of climate change effect, effects 
including those that are more, perhaps more difficult and slow and insidious to recognize and are less dramatic. Also here, the, the director talks a little bit about loss and the fact that we must recognize that some of our decision making may involve loss. And a quote here about us collaborating together, that we must move forward before we have all the information, but based on the best available information, but we integrate more information as it becomes available to us. There's also a cultural resources climate change strategy. You saw a, a National Park Service climate change response strategy. Well, there's now under development a cultural resource climate change uh, strategy. And the draft document includes this flow chart. I think it will be available to you relatively soon. It divides our process into research, planning, and stewardship. And that's how we think about cultural resources management in the service. We have policy and guidance for how we do research, for planning, and stewardship. And if we break this down into the, the research, the top part of that flow chart, this is really about using climate change projections, using vulnerability assessments on a landscape scale, to prioritize the areas to be inventoried on the ground that haven't been inventoried already or underwater. That what we want to come out of this first effort is a prioritization of resources that need action. In the planning stage, we develop goals for vulnerable resources, we identify a range of adaptation options, and we filter those options through constraints and opportunities. And then the, the stewardship stage, we adopt and implement actions on a cyclic basis, typically with preservation maintenance. But we monitor and we continue to make adjustments as necessary. But if conditions on the ground change, we return to the planning stage. Or if climate projections change, we, turn, we return to the research stage again. So this is a climate change uh, cultural resources strategy that hopefully will be available fairly soon. Tools that we're using to identify cultural resource impa impacts from climate change on a service-wide scale include stepping up and refocusing our use of inventory, our Section 110 work. We do inventories for historic structures, for archaeology, for cultural landscapes. And we reassess condition on a periodic cycle. So we do an inventory, then we go back and we do it again we, we update it, we do a condition reassessment, and now we're using vulnerability to climate change impacts as a driver to identify the interval at which we will redo the condition assessment. And we have uh, adopted a more extensive range of condition impacts to select from in documenting the condition of cultural resources. And this is a these are um, a bunch of standardized impacts that we can pick from in our inventory work to identify condition. And the reason why we pick from a pick list, there are over more than 40 impacts that we can pick from, is so that we can query a service-wide database of cultural landscapes and understand where there are patterns of familiar types of impacts occurring. And so we've added some impacts recently that are particular to climate change phenomena. Also, the Climate Change Response Program in National Park Service is working on a new tool that's a resource vulnerability assessment framework. And the underlying philosophy behind it is that the vulnerability of a resource to climate change impacts is based on the climate change phenomena and the amount of exposure that the resource is getting to those phenomena minus its adaptive capacity, it's a capacity to adapt, uh, either our ability to adapt it or its own inherent ability to adapt. And um, this is something that is being worked on in FY16. Also, there's about half the national parks, about 408 units, about half of those, now have climate projection models for each park on a park scale that can be integrated in our research and planning and stewardship efforts. Something that's brand new as of this past week that is under internal review will be going out to, um, to all agencies and the public in probably in 2016 is a Coastal Adaptation Strategies Handbook. 
And so this has just been released for internal review. But it's uh, 24 case studies of national parks adapting to climate change. And the report highlights how climate change will impact infrastructure, cultural and natural resources in these park units. And the report is not prescriptive, but it illustrates examples of potential actions that other parks might take with similar circumstances in response to climate change. It includes this map that shows trends in sea levels um, up and um, with isostatic rebound in Alaska, southeast Alaska, also sort of apparent sort of more elevation of land relative to, to sea. We, um, the report contains some compelling case studies like this one is actually in Lake um, Yellowstone Lake, Yellowstone National Park, showing a um, historic cabin cluster and it's a threat to be inundated by lake waters and talks about the, the reasons for that and what adaptation options the park is exploring. And it also identifies that 111 units out of 408 <coughs> national parks are vulnerable to sea level change. Okay, so this is where I sort of segue and go a little bit rogue, but Barbara has sanctioned it. So uh, that climate change information, you can find it at MPS, climate change, you'll get to the climate change response program. You can find all of that. So that some thoughts I was having yesterday, and that's why I was a bad girl and didn't get my thing in the drop box at the right time to have it show up here. So we have um, national register property types, of course, object, structure, building, site, and district. And then the National Park Service has cultural resource categories archaeology, historic structures, museum collections, ethnographic resources, and cultural landscapes. So for the National Park Service and the program that I manage, a cultural landscape is a category of cultural resource, kind of a counterpart to archaeology. Not one and the same, but distinct from. But sharing some overlap, obviously, considerable overlap. For us in the National Park Service, a cultural landscape must be something that is eligible for the register as a site or a district. When we name a cultural landscape, we do so in concert with a DOE from the SHPO, and that basically says it's eligible for the register, and it's going to be eligible as a site or a district. So in our world, our world has to fit into the sieve, the filter of the National Register framework, and cultural landscapes are eligible as sites or districts. Of course, historic structures have a very neat fit, object structures and buildings. Museum collections, if they're nominated, they'll go on as objects. Ethnographic resources can find themselves in any of these property types, which is really fantastic and fluid. But archaeology and cultural landscapes, of course, both share this phenomenon of being listed on the register as sites or districts. So for cultural, in the National Park Service, the cultural landscapes are not the same thing as the universal definition understanding of what cultural landscapes are. We have Carl Sauer and great thinkers that thought of cultural landscapes as any lands, any place in the globe where there is an imprint of humanity. That is not what we mean in the National Park Service by a cultural landscape and the cultural landscapes program. And when we use that term in cultural resources management, we're meaning lands that are eligible for the National Register as a site or a district. It's sad, but true. So ours is a small piece of the pie. They're properties with historic significance and integrity. They're eligible for listing on the National Register places, and we do it as sites or districts. But we do it, we try and do it with a little bit of a twist, an expansive twist, but I think it's something that is endorsed by the National Park Service and um, National Register. We work well with, with Barbara and her colleagues. We use a typology of landscape characteristics for identifying and evaluating the integrity of landscapes. And those are a system, they are landscape characteristics of patterns that are both historic and still exist, paleo or still exist. And they either influenced the use or development of the landscape historically, and they still exist today is the, the kicker there. So we use these as a mechanism for seeing integrity in the landscape. And then we 
organize the National Register nomination by including these landscape characteristics and their associated features in Section 7 and Section 8 of the National Register nomination. The description of the property and the statement of the significance. The point is to build the case through these characteristic patterns on the ground. Tell how they belong to the historic context and how they are still evident today. It's very important that they appear in Section 7 and 8 and they be sort of reinforced in the description of the property but also in the statement of significance. So we can, even though these don't end up in that contributing resources count, they are there. They are what is within the boundary of the site or district, all of these things, and they are included in the narrative of the nomination. The downside of this approach, of course, is that these features are not specifically counted in that list of contributing resources that appears on the second page of the nomination. And possibly nationwide, recognition of landscapes as something worth preserving may be undermined by using the vocabulary site or district to refer to a landscape. Landscape is a more comfortable term for everything, but we use site or district as sort of this abstract um, concepts. And it's not possible to count districts within districts. We need sites within districts. It sort of limits our granularity of analysis somewhat. But on the positive side, we do have landscapes listed on the National Register as sites and districts. And cultural, natural cultural features can be included in nominations in those narrative sections. So once again, if I go back to here, we have natural systems and features. The natural systems are those phenomena that shaped the development or use of that landscape historically, and that res the response to those is still evident today. So we can include natural features clearly in nominations of sites and districts. They don't end up in that countable co contributing resource count, but they are there. And it, we need better guidance from the National Register, improved, enhanced guidance and bulletins. We need the SHPOs to get on board and understand that sites and districts do represent landscapes and they are matrices of historic patterns interwoven. And we need to, need to write more quality nominations, more holistic, and write them well enough to justify what it is we are nominating. And final thought here is that every National Register property, those five property types, they all can have a setting. Setting is one of the um, aspects of integrity. So objects have a setting. The setting of an object is outside of its, its boundary, but it's a setting. A, si a, a structure, a building, they have a setting. Sites and districts can have a setting beyond their boundaries. We can talk about the integrity and the historic context of that setting. And so some of this stuff, these ideas that we feel frustrated can't necessarily be brought in within the description of a site or district boundary can be included in the nomination narrative in the explanation and description of setting. And this could lead to viewshed easements, conservation easements, zoning and planning codes, design guidelines that could potentially protect these things. It's not as sort of a wasted effort to identify some things as setting. They can be leveraged for great planning work. So thank you very much for that. <laughs>